Well, welcome to the gathering. Uh, welcome everyone watching online, wherever you're watching from, welcome. So we are excited to, to kick off our Nudge 2.0 series today. See, one of the ways God brings people out of the grave, because truth is, sometimes we get kind of comfy in the little tomb, and, and God says, okay, I want to move you out, and he uses a foot wedge, also known as a nudge, to do so. A nudge is the sudden, deep-down sense from God that you ought to do something inconvenient in the moment. By show of hands, has anyone ever had a nudge? Yes. But the thing about a nudge, be careful because although they're sudden and although they happen in the moment, oftentimes the actions of a nudge are ongoing. Let me illustrate it this way. Um, Cam, is your hip better? Good enough to hold a plank? All right. I'm I'm, going to use Cam because Cam was here three years ago when we did this. And uh, yeah, come on up here, Cam. That's your good looking self. Come on up here. All right. So so what I want to do, come on over here. Let's go over here. Maybe face that little speaker right there with your head. And if you would get down in the plank position and I'll tell you when to start. So because I know you only got so much, so much left in the tank. You know what I'm saying? So, oh, okay. He's going to go. All right. All right. You, you're running things. So a nudge is much like a plank. The benefit of the plank, I mean, it's easy to initialize, right? I mean, to, to start. But the benefit of the plank is seen as the duration of that plank increases. Tell them to hold the plank. Cam, hold the plank, okay? You all right? You doing okay? Okay. Much better than Julian was doing it first service. And, and he was struggling. I'm not going to lie. You were struggling, but, but you're hiding it well. I think you're struggling too. So let me give you an example of what I'm trying to say. So we had a, a girl from the gathering not too long ago, uh, had a nudge to help a homeless lady here in Surprise. And so she went and gave her $20. That was, the, that was the sudden movement of God. That was a nudge. But as she was leaving, she had a nudge. That nudge continued to, he said, go love on her. So she said, keep the $20. And she, she took her to, uh, to, to dinner. And then the nudge continued. She got her hotel. Then the nudge continued. The next day was a Sunday. She brought her to church on that Sunday. And the nudge still continued because she's continuing to, to mentor that person. You see what I'm saying? Like it, it's, a, it's a quick, sudden, I got a nudge. But oftentimes the actions are like this, right? And we have to complete the nudge. You doing all right? Yep. You doing, I'm impressed, man. <laughs> I'm impressed. So here's the thing. If we're honest, our life, the highway of our life is littered with incomplete nudges. Nudges that started off well-intentioned, right? Started off, and, and, and along the way, it started to get hard. It started to get difficult. Our, 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 our midsection started to shake. <laughs> Don't worry, no one's watching. For the love of God, we got people in Kenya watching your nudge, okay? It's somewhere along the way, the nudge, I'm going to help you out, brother, okay? Do not put this on social media. Not that kind of church, okay? I'm just trying to help a brother out, okay? But somewhere along the line, the nudge died, right? And God's telling us the same thing I'm telling Cam. It's the title of the message. Hold the plank. Say it with me. Hold the plank. Louder. Hold the plank. One more time. Hold the plank. Good job, buddy. Get up here. Oh, give him a hand. Woo! Hunk of burden love right there. You still got him, my man. Three years. We'll do it again in three years, okay, brother? Oh, man. Is it still cracked? <laughs> it is now. Oh, man. Oh. oh, okay. I love that guy. Hey, you said you said you wanted authentic, you know. <laughs> Family authenticity and mission. All right, so here we go. Let's get into God's word as we transition from that. <laughs> Acts 16. We're going to begin Acts 16, verse 16. We're going to see some guys hold the plank. Paul and Silas, they're on their second missionary journey. They're witnessing in Philippi. 
Philippi is a Roman controlled city in Northern Greece. And uh, they have a female slave who was demon possessed and, and who would follow them around, heckle them, you know. And so finally, Paul gets a nudge and he removes the demon from her. And when he removes the demon, all hell literally breaks loose. And I want you to see how they hold the plank and what happens because they held the plank. Lord, thank you that you would help me preach this like you preach it to me. God, speak mightily through us. We need your word. We need your truth today in Jesus' name. Amen. Acts 16, 16. Once when we were going to the place of prayer, we were met by a female slave who had a spirit by which she predicted the future. She earned a great deal of money for her owners by fortune telling. Pause. God, only God is omniscient. No one can predict the future. No one can tell you the future. That's a lie. So uh, just want to clear that up. Verse 17. She followed Paul and the rest of us shouting, these men are servants of the most high God and are telling you the way to be saved. And I read that and I thought, wow, isn't that funny? Even the demons know the truth, right? They can recognize godly people. Verse 18, she kept this up for many days. Finally, Paul became so annoyed that he turned around and said to the spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, I command you to come out of her. At that moment, the spirit left her. When her owners realized that their hope of making money was gone, in other words, their meal ticket was now gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to face the authorities. They brought them before the magistrates and said, these men are Jews and they're throwing our city into an uproar by advocating customs unlawful for the Romans to accept their practice. The crowd joined in the attack against Paul and Silas and the magistrates ordered them to be stripped and beaten with rods. After they had been severely flogged, they were thrown into prison and the jailer was commanded to guard them carefully. You know, one of the reasons it's so hard to live out our nudge, so hard to hold that plank, is because sometimes your nuisance is your nudge. That thing that annoys you, sometimes God used that to deploy you. In this case, it was a nagging woman. retreat. So it's interesting that the, the, the Bible says for many days, and it makes you wonder as you read that scripture, for many days she did this. And you have to wonder, did, did, did the Holy Spirit, did the nudger nudge Paul many days ago? I, we don't know, but if, if I were to guess, if, and again, it's a guess, I would say probably had nudged him right away to, to, to heal this woman. But we don't always listen to the Holy Spirit. We don't always listen to the nudger. And so God says, okay, we can do it the hard way. I can let her haggle you for the next 10 days, right? I can, I can do it that way. And it's kind of like a, um, we have this woodpecker at our, uh, at our house. Sound of freedom right there. Sound of freedom. So we have this woodpecker and, and, and every once in a while, he'll come around and he'll peck on the, uh, on the top of our fireplace, it's like a, the, the little flue there, the little vent, and it's, it's, it's metal. This dumb little woodpecker doesn't, can't tell the difference between wood and metal. And so it just peck, this incessant pecking. Peck, 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 peck. And you can't do anything about it, be, legally, because they're, <laughs> legally, because they're protected. Now you could, of course, get some poison meatballs and practice your juggling. And if one of them took a fortuitous bounce up on the... No. I'm not advising that. I'm teasing. Relax, guys. But you know, that's kind of like... The, sometimes... The, me, 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 what's your nuisance? For, for Paul, he had a nuisance, and it was the very thing that God was nudging him to fix, nudging him toward. The one thing he wanted to get, get away, God said, no, I want you to deliver her. And it wasn't just that. It wasn't just the girl that annoyed him. It was actually the, the, the city of Philippi. We're going to learn here in a little bit that he didn't want to go to Philippi. He wanted to go elsewhere. 
And so he gets to Philippi, and, and if you notice in verse 16, where were they meeting for prayer? They're meeting down by the river for prayer. Why wouldn't they meet in the synagogue? Because according to, to Jewish law, you would have to have 10 Jewish males to have a synagogue. They didn't have 10 males. It's called a, a minion, not like our minion. M, it's Y-A-N, minion. That's a tin, it's a quorum of, of 10 Jewish. They didn't even have enough to, to have a synagogue. He didn't want to be there. And he certainly didn't want this nagging lady following him around. And yet God said, oh, that, that, that nuisance, that's your nudge. I'm nudging to, to, to help her, to deliver her, to heal her. Who's your nuisance? Who is it? Is it a jerk at work? Is it like a, a, a Dwight Schrute at work? <laughs> All right. God might be calling you to, to help him. Turns out Dwight Schrute needs Jesus. For Riley, for my daughter, it was Pastor Jordan this week. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm not even joking. We were, we, were, uh, we were handing out flyers on Wednesday. I got home about five minutes before did, she did. Riley comes into the house. Dad, you, you got to look at my car. I said, what's wrong? Pastor Jordan said the right front tire is spinning. Can you fix it? I said, let me put my thinking cap on just for a second, sweetheart. So your right front tire is spinning. Like, is it in a circular motion that's spinning? Yeah, no, we, we fixed it. For, for my wife, why you're laughing. Oh, no, a few weeks ago, Levi. Levi was your nuisance. Remember what he did? When you're, yeah, when you're, when you're, her, her, she went to turn on her blinker, and the blinker didn't work. And so she says, Levi, I need... And so she texts me. She said, hey, sweetheart, my blinker's not working. Levi asked me if you could pick up some blinker fluid. <laughs> Can't write this stuff. I'm just telling you. It's, it's just... <laughs> so uh, for me, you know what my nuisance was this week? Went to, uh, went to the gym. I know a lot of you go to the same gym. I went to the gym, and I, this... Jack wagon is parked in the uh, handicap. He's got a 20 inch lift on that sucker and he's parked in the handicap. I think, Come on, man. See, sometimes our, 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 our nudge is the thing that annoys us. It's our nuisance. And yet God loves people who can't drive and park in bad places, right? He loves people like, because sometimes we're that guy. I'm that guy to somebody else. I, I just wonder who your nuisance might be. Maybe for some, if you're honest, you say, you know what? At times I feel like my nuisance, nuisance is sitting right next to me. Maybe you have a, a spouse who, who betrayed you. Maybe it's a, a parent who mistreated you or a family member that wounded you. I want to tell you, God wants to do something great in your life. He wants to nudge you. But here's what I, what I need to tell someone. I don't know who this is for, but you can't be nudged when you're holding a grudge. God wants to nudge you. He wants to deploy you. But, but a lot of us, we're holding a grudge. And so that very thing that God wants to release us into, wants us to do in our life, we can't do because of unforgiveness. We're praying for breakthrough, but you're not going to get it because your prayers are hindered. Mark eleven twenty five. 25. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins too. Friends, unforgiveness is the poison we drink hoping others will die. Don't drink that poison. Lay that down at the foot of the cross and say, I forgive you. Set yourself free so that you can be nudged into the place that God wants you to. Sometimes your nuisance is your nudge. Let's read on, verse 24. When he received these orders, he put them in the inner cell, that's the jailer, put the, Paul and Silas in the inner cell and fasten their feet in stocks. So what are stocks? Stocks would be, um, yeah, like a big, a wooden implement that basically um, almost looks like a, a big railroad tie and they would have been able to put their feet through and close them down. The, the stocks would have been fastened to the prison floor or to the wall. They would have sat on a, a cold uh, dirt floor or perhaps um, straw. They would have been in this position, and this is not a comfortable position. There would have been rodents and insects running about. It would have not been a, uh, 
a prison like we would think of today. Um, and there they were. And it says, about midnight. I want to talk to you about midnight. Midnight is something that someone can relate to today. Someone, you feel like you're in the midnight of your nudge. God called you out on something, called you to do something. Maybe it was, maybe it was something when you were a young child. Maybe a calling God whispered to you. Or something, you, something God called you to. And, and, you, and you feel like, you know, it's cold, it's dark, it's tired. And you're, 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 you're doubting. You're doubting that nudge. It's your midnight of your nudge. You know, you know where nudges often die? Midnight. That's when the lies of the enemy, he whispers, and, and we actually start to believe them when we're tired, when we're cold, when we're lonely, and there's no one else around to help, help us. That's when, be careful, that's when you can feel the breath of the evil one in the back of your neck. So it's midnight, and here's where everything changes. Here's the pivot in the story. You ready? Here's the truth. Second truth. Learn to pivot through praise. God gave you a powerful weapon. You think we just sang that song because it sounds cool? Dead men come out of that grave? If you, we have resurrection power. When we sing the name of Jesus, let me, let me illustrate it from God's word. Verse 25, about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. So there they are in their stocks, their bottoms falling asleep. Try sitting like this for a while. Eventually it falls asleep and you start to you check out, right? And so there they are, bloody, beaten, tired, cold, rats running around everywhere. Midnight, dark, what do they do? They pray and sing hymns to God. And the other prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent pivot, such a, a violent earthquake that the foundations of the prison were shaken. At once the prison doors flew open and everyone's chains came loose. Are you kidding me? What pivoted? What was, what was the impetus? What was the driving force behind everything changing? What was it? Praise. We have a weapon that we so rarely use. What's your go-to song? When, when you're in your midnight of your nudge, what's your go-to song? Come on, born-again believers, Christians who are, I'm not talking to new people who maybe. Huh? This is my church. Oh, this is my church. Who sings that? It doesn't matter. Huh? It doesn't matter because you can sing it, right? Because you know what's even better than tr cranking on your Christian radio is when you become the Christian radio, when you just bellow out praise. And sometimes you, you, you have tears coming out your, 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 your eyes. You have snot running out of your nose because maybe something happened and you're just so broken and so hurt. And you know what? Man, when you, when, you, when you praise God in those kind of moments, I think those are the most meaningful praises to God. I mean, it's easy to praise him. When everything's, I love, I love what uh, Charles Spurgeon said. Any fool can sing in the day. It's easy to sing when you, you can read notes by daylight. But the skillful singer is he who can sing when there's not a ray of light to read by. See, I, I want to be that guy. Don't you? Like, it, am I alone? Or do you like, like it, it, when all hell's breaking loose, and, and, and sometimes hell breaks loose in our lives. Can we just be honest? Like, it, sometimes we have our days, we have our moments. And when, when that happens, like, I want to be the guy that, the, the situation doesn't have to be all hunky-dory and perfect for me to praise God. Like, I want to be able to, to be found being faithful in the rough times, not just in the good times. What's, what's your song? What's your jam? What is it? Come on. Promises? Everything to me? How great thou art. That's, that's oldie but goldie. Come on. I decided to follow Jesus. Amen. You know, you know what mine, I, I, mine is? I love you, Lord, and I lift my voice to worship you. Oh my. I mean, like sometimes I just have to get quiet, get away from the madness, and just worship God. Because if I don't, I'm going to go cray-cray. <laughs> I want to tell you something that you didn't, didn't know about me. And I probably should have told you this long ago. But I'm going to come out with it. I've been to prison. Yeah, I've been to prison. I've never been to a penitentiary, but I've been to a prison. My prison was a church plant that I started 
three years ago. You see, at times, what you didn't see behind the scenes, you see the stuff on the weekend, but, but if you could see behind the curtain, there were nights where I felt like it was midnight, where people were taking shots at me, saying things about me that weren't true, and it hurt, y'all. It hurt. But my midnight verse, it wasn't quite so godly. It wasn't quite so cool. Like his, you know, verse 25, his was a midnight verse. At midnight, Paul and Silas were praising and singing hymns to God. If I'm honest, and I read my midnight verse at times through that three years, it would sound more like this. At midnight, John was angry at God, doubting his calling and wondering if he should have planted this church, tempted to go online and look at jobs on amazon.com. You want the truth. I mean, maybe, maybe you have a midnight verse where you're like there too. And it has a happy ending. The happy ending is because of Jesus, because Jesus brought me through. But you know how he brought me through? It wasn't, sometimes we pray to Jesus, Jesus bring me through. And he's like, okay, um, use what I gave you. Start worshiping. And I had to praise my way through my prison. And I just wonder who I'm, t- I'm preaching to today, who, who, who's, who's in a self-imposed prison. I mean, I think we've all been to prison, haven't we, at times? And you're in a self-imposed prison, and God's saying, you need to sing your way out of it. You've got to start praising. You've got to worship through it. I, uh, I, I moved to Ohio in, uh, in the seventh grade from California. The, the town I moved to didn't have a, 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 they didn't have a football team. I was a football player. And so I had to learn basketball. I wasn't very good, but I learned quickly. Well, my seventh grade coach, Coach Cruzy, he helped me out because I didn't have all the fundamentals. This is called a pivot right? And when you pivot in basketball, whatever, choose, whatever foot, when you come to like a jump stop, whatever foot you choose to pivot on can pivot, but it can't move other than pivot. It can't do that. That's a no-no. That's called a travel, okay? That's a violation in basketball. And Johnny liked to travel a lot because I'd get there, I'd be like, you know, kind of like you on Tuesday night, Shane. I mean, you got called for two of them. He got a little excited. He got the ball, and he saw that. I'm going to put, the, put this in the hoop, and he just like sat and just, <laughs> So don't worry. I was there too. Granted, I was in the seventh grade. but So, so there I was. And, and I, think, I think we got a lot of people who like to drag their pivot foot in church. Yeah. Yeah. I think we've got a lot of people who drag their pivot foot. What, what happens is, is, is we're called to nudge, right? We're called to a nudge, and God says, hold the plank. And things get a little tough. Things get a little hard. We suffer a little bit of persecution. We suffer a little bit of attack. And what happens? I'm, I'm going to drag this over here. I'm going to start another nudge. We drag our pivot foot. And you know, you know how Coach Cruzy taught me to, how to fix this? I want to share it with you. He said, pretend that you have a nail. And that nail is driven through the end of your... your uh, Sneaker, okay? So, you know me. <laughs> and next time I got to remind me to take my foot out before I put that, you know. Um, so, and he said, just drive it, pretend that's in there, and just pound that sucker right into the, and you know what? That image stuck with me. And I, I almost, I mean, I probably traveled a few more times, but not a lot, y'all. Because I always had that image of, of, that, of that being planted in the floor. And I think when it comes to our nudge, when it comes to holding the plank, I think what God is, is, is saying to us today is that we need to stop dragging our pivot foot. Tell your neighbor, stop dragging your pivot foot. Yeah, we need to be, we need to be planted in praise. Not planted in the news. Not planted in, in you know, some sort of negativity. I'm saying we need to plant ourselves right there on the cross. Now, let's put the verse up. Put the verse up. David said, I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. In other words, I'm going to store up some praise in here because midnights are coming and there's going to be a time where I don't know if I'm going to make it without you. 
right? When, 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 when all hell is breaking loose in our life and we just need to praise, we need to pivot through praise, we need to worship. Remember that song? I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Hey, I shall not be, I shall not be moved. Come on, some of you, I know some of you older folks. I'm sorry, I'm looking at you, that's mean. Some of you seasoned veterans. They look way too young to be a seasoned veteran. Are you even a seasoned veteran? Okay. But you remember that song? I shall not be, I shall not move. I shall not be, I shall not be. Like a tree planted by the living water, I shall not be moved. You know, we used to have a lot of fun in church. God's saying stay planted. What'd you learn from Pastor John's? Stay planted. Hold the plank. You want a word from God? There's your word from God. Stay planted. Hold the plank. Learn to pivot through praise. Amen? Amen. And lastly, we need to allow, and this is going to sound weird. It's going to sound weird, but just roll with this. It's from God's word. I'll, I'll prove it. Allow your nudge to become your noose. Okay? Uh, we need to learn to allow our nudge, the thing that, uh, to be our noose. Verse 27, the jailer woke up, and when he saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because he thought that the prisoners had escaped. According to Roman law, if you lose a prisoner, you take on their sentence. Clearly, we can conclude that there were prisoners there that had, were, were capital offense prisoners. So he thought, well, I'm going to get killed anyways. I may as well kill myself. Paul says in verse 28, don't harm yourself. We're all here. The jailer called for the lights, rushed in, and fell trembling before Paul and Silas. He then brought them out. Did you catch that? He, the jailer, then brought them, the prisoners, out. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Asked the jailer. Wow. Okay, a couple things come to my mind. Who was, who was in prison? Who was the one that was really in prison? Was it Paul and Silas? Or was it the jailer? Just because you're on the other side of the bars doesn't mean you ain't in prison. Not knowing Jesus, that's prison. And then I love how he, he brought them out. It's like God was saying, bring them out so I can bring you in. Not, to, not into prison, but into eternity. Whew. But what would keep them in that prison cell? Guys, if the, if the doors fly open, the stocks, they, they, they fly off, the chains come off. Wouldn't you run out? Of course you would. So would I. What kept him in that prison that day? A nudge. Jesus kept him in that prison that day. And if you read the rest of the chapter, which I encourage you to go home, read the rest of it. You'll find that at the end, after they were being set free, they divulged that Paul and, and, and Silas were actually Roman citizens. Why does that matter? Because they could have, and first of all, he, Paul was a, a Roman citizen. He was a Jew, but he was born in Tarsus, which was modern-day Turkey. And because he was born there, it was a free city. It was under Roman rule. He was considered uh, a, a Roman citizen, which, by the way, of all the Roman Empire, only 5 to 10% of people had Roman citizenship. It was a big deal. And yet he didn't play that card. Why didn't he play that card? And, and, and choose to, to say, hey, look, you can't flog me. It's against Roman rule. I'm a Roman citizen. Why didn't he play that card? Because the nudge demanded that he didn't play the card. It was the nudge. It was God. It was love that kept him on the other side when the doors flung open. And I, I think sometimes when we see open doors in our life, we mistakenly say, you know what? That open door must be from God. I went down to the car dealer. Yes, sir, I did. I went right down there. And some guy in a three-piece suit with a pocket protector and 17 pins who cares nothing about me said that I qualify for a $600 car payment. And so I told him to give me the biggest car you can, buddy. It must be from God. It must be an open door. Or I went to interview at a restaurant and the manager of the restaurant said, oh, I see great promise in you. You need to leave your job and come here. Why? Because in three months, I see you running the place. And by that, he means for the next three years, you're going to be wa washing dishes, running the dish tank, right? Or, or an open door. We, this, this is the big one right here. Open door for another church, 
right? And, and sometimes God calls you to another church and praise God. We ain't the only church in town. If God calls you away, you go. But what I'd hate to see happen is when people bounce from a church because they think it's an open door. I went to the, this other church and I, heard, I felt the presence of God. And by that, they mean the absence of conviction of sin because we actually talk about sin here. We talk, and why? Not to beat you up, but to bring you out, to bring me out, to bring us out so that we can live the lives God's called us to live and not settle for less. It's from love that, that and yes, obedience first and foremost, but it's from love that I preach the gospel to you. I pour this out because this is life and we need it. And sometimes the truth hurts. It hurts me sometimes. Sometimes I'm preaching up here and I feel so convicted by my own message. But I love what Ron Smith said. He said, there was a time people went to church, heard the truth and wept over their sins. Today, people go to church and hear motivational speech and ignore their sins. And friends, we can't ignore our sins. We're broken and we need Jesus. We need Jesus in our life. That's freedom. But Paul and Silas, they saw an open door for the second missionary journey, right? The first one went great. And, and the first, let's put that map up. The first, this, this was their first missionary journey. I had a laser pointer, but that screen's so bright that it didn't work. So unless I can get some mad hops and get up there and point, um, which I can't, uh, I'm just going to tell you, I'm going to describe it. So basically they went to the eastern side of what was Asia Minor at that time. And then they turned around. That was the first missionary journey. So the second missionary journey, they're all excited. They're like, you know what? We are going to Asia Minor. We're going to get those places that we haven't reached, taking the gospel across the world. So they felt like that was an open door. And so what happens? Uh, hang on, hang on. I need, I need a volunteer, uh, 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 someone who won't be offended, someone who won't take life too seriously. Schiffer, come on up. He's a firefighter. How many are thankful for our police and our firefighters? Come on. Oh, yeah, baby. Yes. Thankful, thankful, thankful. So come on. Oh, and he's got a cowboy hat, too. So... Uh, so here's what I want to do. Let me, let me do this. All right. How you doing? Good. Doing all right? Yeah. I'm a cow. I'm a fireman. <laughs> That's my name. Who's that? George Strait? Yeah. Yeah, George Strait. You know that song, right? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Blame it all on my roots. Showing up in marriage. All right. Just a little Garth to get you in the mood, okay? All right, so here's what happened. I'm going to illustrate what happened because otherwise y'all are going to forget. So Paul and his companions travel, verse 6, throughout the region of Phrygia and Galatia. This is weird. Like, you know, take the, take the gospel all across the earth, right, to the ends of the earth. Okay, okay, God, we're going to do that. We're going into Asia. Hmm. Having been kept by the Holy Spirit from preaching the word in the province of Asia. That's weird. Does God have something against Asia? No, he doesn't. But there was a reason. What's the reason? Well, we don't really know. We know that the place he sent them to had the poorest churches, unlike Asia, and so maybe he, there was a priority there. But the truth is, we don't know. We don't know why. Let's read on. Hang on. Um, verse 7, when they came to the border of Mysia, they tried to enter Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus would not allow them to. I want to show you what kept looks like, because... We talk about nudges all the time. We think of a nudge as, I'm going to go do something. And sometimes the nudge is a noose that keeps us from doing something. So sometimes we get, go, get right off the edge there. What I want you to do is get on the edge with those nice high-dollar cowboy boots. <laughs> Looks like they could use some shoe polish. <laughs> all right? And I want you to lean forward a little bit. And here's what happens. Here's, I'm representing the Holy Spirit. And he's representing the rest of us on the precipice of disaster, ready, ready to step off into oblivion, ready to step off and do something or say something to your spouse you shouldn't say. Never done that. <laughs> okay? Let's really, let's really test the waters. Let's test the waters. Come on. Are you all right? Oh, keep your feet straight. Don't, come on. Holy Spirit ain't gonna let you go. If you go, you're not dying on my watch. <laughs> oh! Oh, yeah, ready? Come on, I'm pulling you back. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. That was awesome. 
You all right? Yeah. Nice. Thank you. Oh, that worked much better than first service. Whew. First service, I had this really big dude, and you know, Scott Hill, he was like, it's too, too, too hard. No offense, Scott. But I want you to see what that looks like, because how many times has God nudged us in reverse? I was thinking about calling a message the reverse nudge, but sometimes he gives us the, the reverse nudge, and he keeps us from all sorts of, uh, of chaos. And put that, put that I want to show you now the, the picture of their second missionary journey, Okay. They started, they went through, uh, you know, all, all the, basically Galatia, all the, the green there. They went through all of that, what they did the first time, visited all the churches they planted. Everything's going great. And then God, they, they try to go into Asia, which he says, no, you, you, you can't go into Asia. And yet he lets them go through, which is a really interesting principle that God, think about this. God is letting them go through Asia, but not to Asia. I wonder who's that's, who that speaks to today. You're going through something, but the jailer didn't live in Asia. The woman who was possessed didn't live in Asia. They had to go through Asia to get to the jailer, to get to the nudge that God was calling them to. I, here's what I'm saying. God takes us through it to take us to it. I'm going to say it again. Someone's going through something, and you need to hear this today. Let this sink into your spirit. God takes us through it to take us to it. God took me to three churches. Well, more than that, really, but I'll just tell you about three. CCV, great church. God took me through there. I had some offers to, to be able, to, 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 be able to, to serve there and to work there. God took me to another church in, in, in Missouri, Columbia, Missouri, a great church out there, Woodcrest. But except for the weather, the weather was terrible but it's a good church. God took me to a church in Paradise, California. And with a name like Paradise, how could it be wrong, right? And, and God said, I'm just taking you through this. The two, my two was here, the gathering. I wonder if God's taking you through something and, and, and you've lost sight because it's easy to do so. And I did when I was in that season too. If you, have you lost sight of the two because you're stuck in the through? Maybe you're in a rough spot. God's taking you through a rough spot of your marriage. Maybe God's taking you through a financial challenge. Maybe God's taking you through a health battle. Maybe it's mental health. Maybe he's taking you through loneliness and you feel like I'm stuck in my through. God wants me to tell you, stop looking at your through as your final resting place. It's like the old hymn, I'm just a passing through. I'm just passing through. I'm just passing through it so I can get to the to it, right? I'm just passing through. You got to preach that to yourself. And, and here's what God spoke to me, and I believe this is prophetic for someone. He said, what I'm taking you to is greater than what I'm taking you through. What he's taking you to is great, but a mighty work requires a mighty preparation. What God wants to do in your life, it ain't going to be easy. And if it's easy, is it really great? And so the great work requires a great preparation. And the great preparation takes you through your own Asia. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you're going through it. I want to give you hope. Isaiah 43, verse 2. When you go through deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire of oppression, you will not be burned, but the flames will not consume you. You're just passing through. <laughs> Julian, come on up here, man. I want to talk to you real quick. We're going to close with this uh, a 2008 nudge. God nudged Julian back in the day. And uh, I want him to just share that real quick. <laughs> uh, so 2008, I uh, just graduated, was in college. Um, I started this thing called Strength with Scripture. Um, at first, it was just working with kids. Uh, I played basketball in college. So I was training them. That eventually evolved into personal training. Um, and then I kind of realized after a while that, I, well, 
I realized it wasn't God's plan, but I wasn't ready. It's a lot of responsibility trying to be a leader. I'm like, I don't want to do this. So I did not hold my pivot. I traveled mm. way away from that, right? And yeah. so kind of full circle when you go through everything that you've been through, now we're bringing strength and scripture back. Um, we're getting ready to start a gathering group here. Yeah. Um, the sense of this is... Yeah, come on. Come how many on. people... Woo. So how many people lift weights? Lift? Do you work out? Okay, so often you work on your physical physique, and I got wrapped up in this myself, and my spiritual body was extremely weak. Ooh. So part of this group is going to be having like high school kids, middle school kids, grown men, whoever wants to come, join us. We're going to go over Devo. We're going to build a community. We're going to talk about the word, and then we're going to lift and get after it after, right? Um, and on top of that, my goal is that once our youth and our kids start coming and they're enjoying it and they're telling their friends and they get excited and they go to the club, then we're going to usher them into the gathering and we're just going to make this a family and community and keep yeah, growing. Yeah, come on. Yeah. That's awesome. Woo. For 14 years, 2008 till today, if my math is correct, 14 years he held that plank. That's a long time, y'all, for that dream not to die. He held it. And it, there were moments where he was stretched and he was stressed and wondered if it would ever come into fruition. But see, God was taking him through something to prepare him for here. God was taking you. And it's fun to be on the two side once in a while, isn't it? To receive somebody. But the truth is, that's the exception. 14 years to prepare him for today. We, we get to reap those benefits and thank you for all the people that have spoken to your life, the pastors that poured into you, your mama who's watching back home. But like for most of us, it's the 14-year process. That's where we meet people. That's where a lot of us are at today too, and that's okay. But you need to see the, the to it. You need to see the, that's the testimony side, right? We're in the testing right now. 14 years. But here's, here's what I want to leave you with. I want this to, to, I want you to think about this as you, you go out today. Your nudge, my nudge, our nudge is exponential. Let me prove it to you. Verse 31, they replied, this is Paul and Silas to the jailer. What must I do to be saved? Paul and Silas said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. You and your household. <laughs> Now, to be clear, they, they would go back to the house and they would accept Christ. One person's faith didn't save everyone, but one, first, one person's faith could be the impetus. It could be the, the, um, the pathway through which others are saved. What does holding the plank look like? Looks like this. Looks like this. All hell breaking loose, blood dripping off you. Rats running across you. Stench everywhere. It, raising my hallelujah, God. I love you, Lord. And I lift my voice. God, I proclaim your praise in this place, God. You promise you'll never leave me or forsake me. The jailers are just listening. The jailer and, 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 and the other people, right? It says in the text, they were listening. They're listening. They're watching. And, and you know what the cool thing is as he holds his plank? How many people are going to come to know Jesus like the household are going to come into this household who, who at first wanted nothing to do with Jesus? They just saw a big dude who they want to emulate. Like, show me how to get those gains and I'm in. And God's perfectly fine with that. So long as he's going to do what he will do and that is to point people to Jesus, to help people find and follow Jesus. If, if the bait on the hook is a barbell, so be it. That's a great hook. And it might look different for you. You might have a different gifting. You might have a different ministry. You might not be, I don't know, 240 pounds of pure muscle. But you know, you got something to give for the kingdom. God's nudging you in some direction. And a nudge is not profound. It's not something that's, that's so hard to discern, honestly. It looks like being faithful. It looks like holding your plank, just like Cam did. Just hold the plank. Just hold the plank. When you want to give up this week, what's your assignment? 
Boy, you sound really convincing. I just preached my heart out to you and that's what you give me? Good Lord. Michael, you're up next week. For the love of God, what's your assignment? Hold the plank. I want you to go out there as champions. I don't care what your situation looks like. We're saying, yes, I will. Yes, I will. Yeah, you know what? My life ain't perfect, God. Like I had a rough week, but yes, I will. I will go out there and I will fight for you, Jesus, because you fought for me. I will hold that plank even when it feels like, feels like there's an elephant on the top of my back. I will hold that plank. And in doing so, others will come into this household because they see something different in you. They see something special in you. They see a power that this world doesn't have and through which you cannot buy, you cannot purchase. It only comes from Jesus. It only comes from the nudger. Would you hold the plank this week? Bow your heads. Father, I thank you for every person here. Protect us. Love us. Teach us. Guide us. We need you. We need you because the world is watching. And God, you're watching. Even if no one else is watching, you're watching. And that's enough. You're enough. Forgive us for when you, when you, we thought you weren't enough, but you are enough, God. I pray that we would make a difference, that we would be like Paul and Silas. In our own way, in our own form, we would live out that plank. As difficult as that is at times, God, help us do that. Holy Spirit, nudge us in the right direction. Give us strength to live out and to complete our nudge. Help us, Lord, hold the plank every head bowed and every eye closed. If you don't know Jesus and you want to know Jesus, whether you're watching from Kenya or you're watching in, 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 in living your living room, or you're here today and you want to know Jesus, just pray a prayer like this. Say, Jesus, I need you in my life. I confess you as my Lord, and my Savior. Take me out of prison today. Set me free through the blood of Jesus Christ. Set me free today. Thank you for the freedom that cost you everything. Help me live out that freedom for you. For the rest of my life, I am your child. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, let's welcome them into the family of God. Yeah. Welcome to the family of God. If you made that decision, I invite you to stop at our little connect counter. We have a free gift for you. If you need prayer, do not leave up out of here until you receive prayer. We are a family. We do life together. Even if your prayer is messy, even if it's embarrassing, let's, let's pray together and uh, let's do life together. Amen? One last thing. As you leave this place, make sure you go on our Facebook page and share your nudge stories. We have a special section under our Facebook page where you can share your nudge story. Let your story be a testimony to somebody else. So over the next days and weeks of this series, go online, share your nudge story and encourage others just like Julian has encouraged us today. Amen? Amen. As you leave this place, go out, hold your plank and live for Jesus. Amen? Love you guys.